Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. I'm Sai, software engineer at Limitly, Xmeta. Today, I would like to go through Apache Spark. And as you might have heard, Apache Spark is a distributed computing engine. And it's powerful that it can compute almost one petabyte of data at once. And it's even 10 to 100 times faster than Hadoop. But we bring this we bring this in system design interviews whenever we need a sync processing, including me. And uh, the key thing is we might struggle because with my recent interviews, when I introduced this for one of the ad serving questions that I have been asked, I struggled to answer what exactly happens inside Spark. So I want to start with picking an example. So I chose Netflix as a quick example and went deep dive moving forward and connect it to the Spark and introduce like what exactly happens inside Spark. So I also uh, added or attached the timestamp on the description. You can jump whichever section you're interested in and let's move forward. Let's get started with Netflix as an example. Take, take Netflix. The one I'm scrolling over here is my home screen of Netflix and it has suggested these movies as my best picks for today. But question, how did Netflix pick this? I mean, understanding this, how Netflix would compute can push us into the story of Spark system. So let's go ahead and try to understand how this might be computed. Let's go ahead. We just want to understand how this recommendations on the home screen are displayed. And what are the factors that might let the Netflix recommendation system decide those top N movies. So one thing for sure, it should have the list of trending movies because Netflix pushes the trending movies. Second, it should also understand what exactly the user interest could be, which is easier. It might know what genre that I'm super interested in. And last but not least, which is the beast of today's topic, which is the user logs. And if you wonder, why do you need user logs? If a user interacts with a specific content, and recommending that has high chances of letting the user stay on the surface. And what what do I mean by this user logs? You know, so when the user either it he looked at specific movie, Netflix would be sending those events to the backend infra, and it can also track for hey, what are the movies that the user has clicked in? Just send those log events, and it can also look for what the user has searched or what the user has played and at what time the user has paused on a specific movie and what is this specific watch time. So now if you have a question, what is the relationship between this logs and Spark system? Here is the data. So Netflix has around 190 million monthly active users, which translates to 1900 billion, assuming each user generates 10,000 logs per month, because you being on Netflix screen for an hour, you could generate like thousands of logs, like hundreds to thousands of logs. So generating like 1900 billion, which is translated to 60 billion events every single day. So to process such huge events, that's where the spark can play an important role. So given the scale, let's go ahead and see how the Spark system is helping and parallel processing these events. Imagine now you are on Netflix and people are doing a bunch of actions. And as we have seen, probably the potential 60 billion events that's been generated through the UI has been you know, ingested into the log service. Um, you can imagine this service can be something like, like Kafka. And now the data has to get into some sort of data store. You can pick uh, something like SQL and Cassandra, but the problem is they are made for transactions, but not for analytics. And you should need some system that sh has high throughput for both writes and reads, and that supports um, the data reads at low latency, and it should have uh, a huge distribution system service. So I picked HDFS and, um, and this works great for the scenarios. And this is more about how the data is getting ingested. And in terms of the data ingestion, the data would be entered as chains or partitions. It's not like a tabular structure that goes with SQL. So for example, all the you like you know user movie interactions can be a partition of 120 MB 
128 MB chunks. And this could be the schema. It has the user ID, title, events, and the scope where this action has happened. Similarly, we can dump the user watches, which includes the start time and end time and user searches. And the things that you're seeing over here, P1 to P250 is like the partitions, which is, not, which is nothing but the chunks of the data that we can process. And uh, Typically, even at Meta, we used to partition data with the timestamp. So whenever this pack job runs, it can pick that specific partition for a given day. And we also have the user uh, interest and trending. We haven't introduced Spark system set. And now let's go ahead and see how the Spark will be treating data from here and how it would process the 60 billion events worth of data. Let's go on. What exactly is the Spark? As we knew, the Spark is a distributed engine. In simple terms, you can imagine it as a cluster of machines that will run your Spark job. But breaking it, what are the few major components that it has? It has like four major components. First, it's cluster, man cluster master uh, or cluster manager, you could say. And then uh, you have drivers, executors, and red users. So imagine if there is a Spark job that has been submitted, it would be submitted to your cluster manager. And that cluster manager will be sending that to the driver. And you can write your Spark job. In our case, you could say, hey, the logic behind how exactly do we want to process the logs? It could be written in Python, Java, whatever language you're preferable enough. And that's the beauty of Spark. It supports Java, Python, and any other languages. And uh, it was basically written in Java and Scala. So once the driver gets it, the driver converts the entire script to a bunch of schedules. And it's also known as DAG, Directed Acyclic Graph. And it will distribute that plan to the executors. And the executors will sort of go through that plan. Either it could be reading the data and uh, sort of dumping it to its own memory or own SSD on the server, and it passes to the red user, which will run the harder computations like join, and the red users will dump it back to the data store. I know this is very vague, but before jumping in to the entire end-to-end -end flow, these are the four pieces that we need within the Spark system. So within the cluster, we have a cluster manager, we have driver, we have executor and red user. So let's dive deep with a clear example. Here is the step one with the, within the flow. Uh, you have a software engineer that has written, uh, how can we sort of uh, you know, build the recommendation system? For example, he might have written the code that should output you know, this sort of recommendation, which tells, hey, for this user, uh, this should be the title and uh, we should rank this as a one. So this is what the Spark job needs to produce. And this job scheduler might have uh, the query that would help the Spark system to execute. And here is the sample text of how the query might look. It should say, go to HDFS, read the logs, and do some joins and you know compute the feature. And this job scheduler, as a step one, it will go ahead and it will trigger the cluster manager. and the Spark job kicks in at this point. On step two, once the cluster manager has a request, it, it is going to trigger the driver. And this driver, it's going to create a tag. And you can imagine, why do you need this? This piece of logic, the engineers are submitting. You can write this in Python. You can also write this in Java. Since this Spark system or the Spark processes supports multiple languages, and also to make the querying super efficient, this driver is going to make a plan, which is called as tag, which represents directed acyclic graph. Uh, so it could be as simple as, hey, uh, Nav, can you pull all this information from HDFS? So that would be the step one. Then can you shuffle? Shuffle is more like keeping individual user data into one buckets because in hive partitions the data are mixed then you apply group by then you compute the scores and you dump it and technically this part of uh, you know the group by is handled by the user and uh, this piece over here is done by executors which we are going to 
talk in step three and moving forward. So this is all about step two, which is creating the DAG. This step three is super crucial and this is what makes Spark so special. Once this driver, you know, as part of step two, when once it creates this DAG plan, uh, it understands what are the tables that it needs to execute and uh, what are the steps and how, how what is the sequence of steps that it needs to execute. But it has to understand how much of data it needs to process. So it would go to the HDFS and it would say, hey, how many partitions of data do I have in total? And this HDFS might output, hey, you have 450 sort of uh, chunks for user uh, for user interactions and 100 chunks for user watches and one chunk for user interest. You know, it gives the list of chunks. And now this, as a brain of the system, it knows two things, how to execute, how much to execute it. So it talks to the cluster manager. And um, here is one of the important distinction. This cluster manager as an orchestrator, it will kick in the executors and it will also kick in the number of executors based on the load. And once these are ready, this driver container will start assigning tasks. Hey, can you, can you download each partition of user interest? And the important caveat is it doesn't download all the partitions or chains at once. It goes, it takes, picks one task and uh, it I mean, the driver container assigns one task to all, each of the available uh, executors and the executors would download that one chunk and it would store that information to its SSD. And that way it sort of gets the information and it can retain the information that it pulled into the system. So this is step three where once the driver containers has the DAG, it gets the amount of data it needs to process and it, then it controls the executors by assigning the tasks and the executors are responsible to get the information from HDFS and dump that into its SSD, which is cached, not cached, which is stored on the server itself. We are in step four. So till now we have seen the job scheduler, scheduling it to the cluster manager, initiating it to the driver, generating the DAG, and uh, then it is controlling the executors. One thing that I've missed is you can think executors are containers into inside, you know, like one server. So you can have like, you know, multiple servers and you can have like multiple executors and the driver knows information about all these executors and it will handle the tasks. So now the next step, which is the crucial thing and which is also important in terms of performance is that you can imagine this machine now has information about, you know, like logs about uh, user one. Imagine it has two logs that belongs to user one and it has uh, two logs that belongs to user two because all it is doing is it is just downloading the logs, the raw logs from HDFS. And uh, similarly, this sort of machine, the SSD has one log corresponding to user one and two logs corresponding to user two. And the executor's role is only to download and store it onto the SSD and send to the reducer for heavy joins. And while sending, the V would be sending information related to one user to one red user and um, that are called as buckets. So how it does is once, you know, the executor downloads the information from HDFS, it looks at the data and it says, hey, we have information of user one and the count is equal into two. So just combine it. It's it's It doesn't take much time. It's, it's more like map reduce, isn't it? So it combines the information about users and at the end we need to compute score so we can we can simply join it. So the executors join it and it hashes the user ID and it might send that to the user. Similarly, when this instance uh, looks at user one, it could say, hey, we have user one of count one and similarly hash it 
and send it to this red user because user one yields to the same hash value. And this is called shuffling. This is so powerful. And you can see the basic combining within the same instance is done by executors itself. And we don't even lose the data because it's on its SSD. And that way, the data reaches to the red user and the red user will take care of uh, heavy join operations and it computes the score that you're actually seeing over here and then it dumps it to you know uh, the hdfs so to recap um, we have the job scheduler to the cluster manager that's triggering the driver and um, it creates dag and it understand how much data we have it controls the tasks and executor has the basic downloads and the basic operations and give the heavy loading to red user by sending the same user data to one bucket and red user handles the join operations and creates the score and dumps it back to whatever data store that we are choosing for uh, last but not least, let's see how Spark handles the failures, and that would be the final uh, discussions for this video. So we have covered how the Spark starts from the job scheduler, and it ends over here. Now, quickly recap on what happens in case of failure. One of the biggest disadvantage of the Spark is this driver. If this driver container fails, it it misses out the entire tag because the tag is stored in memory of driver container. And it also uh, you know, erases all the tasks that it remembered and which task it want to assign to which executor. So it loses all its memory. And Spark job restarts the entire process in case if driver uh, died. It's not like Flink, which has the checkpointing thing. So if this was gone, everything was gone. But if executor dies, you know, the Kubernetes, the cluster manager will keep an eye and a new system can restart it. And since this executor is storing it on SSD, that's not a problem. The same thing with the reducer. Reducer even stores information in memory and it's SSD. So if it dies, the uh, cluster manager can handle it. Uh, my bad, it's not the cluster manager. The executor can sort of take a look and it can sort of, um, you know, um, trigger to cluster manager, which can spin up the new red user. So we have this orchestrator, and um, which is scalable. And these are all the containers. So if one gets down, the rest would spin up, and everything would look good. So that's a small thing that I want to cover. And um, so this is the end-to-end -end flow, why the Spark is super flexible and super, um, I mean, how it can um, scale to petabytes of data. That's it. Thanks for watching.